James, are you are you there? Yeah. Okay. You want to open with prayer? Sure. Our Father, Yehovah, we give you the greatest uh, appreciation for all that you have done with making this universe, making this planet, making mankind, and giving us life with uh, the responsibilities as to how to live. So that we have a better and a beneficial effect on how we deal with and treat others and how we respond to persecution. We give you thanks that we're enabled over these last years to prepare for this upcoming tribulation so that we have been able to not only prepare ourselves but get the medicine and the food and all items that we might be required to live for several years on our own without the government of mankind intruding and stealing our property and stealing us, in fact, as they claim to have ownership over us. We know that it's you who made us and that it's you, Yehovah, who owns us you have a proper claim on us. You have given us through your word all of the information we need to live a healthy and wealthy life of liberty. But if for some reason, perhaps we, our minds have been affected much more deeply than we can comprehend, so we give you the greatest appreciation that at the beginning of these some New Year's Day of the New Year that we have been given 13 days to prepare ourselves to put ourselves under judgment to make the necessary moves to make sure that we are able through your spirit to correct ourselves to create, take action that accomplishes that correction and then give us the backbone and the stability to maintain that throughout the upcoming year and throughout whatever man, the mind of man, and really the mind of Satan, may put upon us. So we ask, please, for your protection, for your strength, so we can stand up before what's coming and not be afraid of it in any way to be good representatives of your way of life as true ambassadors and that we can be uh, children that you could be proud of. You would please uh, give us information that we may be lacking of understanding your words and your way of life so we don't let you down in any way. So we give you the greatest appreciation for life and all the glory, of course, goes to you. We all recognize that. And we ask, give you thanks for everything you've done. And we ask for all of this, please. We're also, if we could tell you our deep felt regret that we put your son to having to take the burden of our wrongdoing. And so we're grateful that you accepted your son's sacrifice in payment of our debts and uh, help us to be better survivors of the world at large and be good representatives of your way of life. So we give you thanks for all these things and help us to prepare properly for the upcoming Lord's Supper so we can take it in the right way on the right day and we give you thanks for everything. And we ask for this all by the authority of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you, James. Appreciate that.
it uh, dawned on me that uh, I think when I uh, started services, my mic was on mute. <laughs> so I was talking away and you guys probably didn't hear a thing. But anyway, here we are again on the eighth day of the first month. And based on our reckoning in the 41st year of the 40th Jubilee, um, a week away from uh, Passover essentially. So looking forward to that. So if you will all take up your hymnals and open to page 50. On page 50, we'll sing a hymn that comes from Psalm 62, Yah is my rock, my salvation. That's page 50, Yah is my rock, my salvation. Okay, that's a great start for services. If you'll turn over a few pages to page 57, we'll sing a hymn that comes from Psalm 75 titled, Let Us Sing to Yah. After which, uh, I'd like to call upon Mr. Jerry Shalesky to read in the book of Acts, um, chapters 7 through 9, book of Acts chapters 7 through 9, since uh, Wes will be giving us the news um, after the main uh, message. So page 57, let us sing to Yah.
Okay, if you will all be seated, we'll turn the mic now over to Mr. Jerry Shaleski to read in the book of Acts, chapters 7 through 10. Jerry? Uh, can everyone hear me well? Yep, sounds good. I'll be reading out of the King James Version, chapter 7. Then said the high priest, are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Sharon, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into a land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chileans and dwelt in Sharon, and from thence when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein you now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spoke on this wise, that his seed shall sojourn into a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God, and then after that they shall come forth and serve me in this place. And gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him in the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved to Nimbi, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him, and delivered him out of all of his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a dirt over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, Canaan, in great affliction, and our fathers found no substance. When Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sculpture. Sculpture, sculpture that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Sishem. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they casted out their young children, to the end they might not live in which Moses' time was born and was exceedingly fair and nourished up in the father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for his own, her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deed. And when he was full, when he was full 40 years old, it came on to his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffering wrong, he defended them and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brother would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, you are brethren, why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong trusted him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Will thou kill me as thou did the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses as this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Madian, where he begot two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Jehovah in the flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to it, behold it, the voice of Jehovah came unto him. 
saying, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Thus said Jehovah to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for thy place where thy stand it is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them. And now come I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, who they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same could, the same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out of after he had shown wonder, wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall Jehovah your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall you hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spoke to him, in Mount Sinai, with our fathers who received the lively articles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but trusted him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. Saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, for as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifices unto the idol, and rejoice in the work of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, that is, is written in the book of the prophets. O you house of Israel, have you offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Yeah, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your God, Remnathan, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacles of witness in the wilderness, as he had pointed speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he has seen, which also our fathers that came after brought with Jesus in possession of the Gentiles, who God drove out before the faces of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him in a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as said at the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, said Jehovah? Or what is the place of my rest? Has not my hand made all these things? You stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Do you always resist the Holy Spirit? as your fathers did so, do you? Which of the prophets have your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of, you have, of whom now you have, have been now the betrayer and murderer, who has received the law by the disposition of an angel and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfast into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heaven open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Chapter 8. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church was, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he had made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. 
day for they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people at one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spoke, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For the unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsy, and that was lame were healed. There was a great joy in that city, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God, and to him they have regarded, because that of long time he had bewitched him with sorcery. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they would come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet it was fallen upon none of them, only they which were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying honor of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perishes with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for, there, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, perhaps the thought of thy heart may be forgiven. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray you to Jehovah for me, that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. And they, when they have testified and preached the word of Jehovah, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. The angel of Jehovah spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go thy way. Go down from Jerusalem into Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopian, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasures and have come to Jerusalem for to worship was returning and sitting in a chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to the chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he says, How can I except some man guide me? And he, des des and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shears, so opened not he his mouth. In his, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the Enoch answered Philip and says, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, but himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached on to him Jesus. And that they went on their way, they came on to a certain water, and the Enoch said, See, here is water. What doeth hinder me to be baptized? Then Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart that thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went both down into the water, both Philip and Enoch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of Jehovah caught away Philip, that the Enoch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azatos, 
in passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Chapter 9. And Saul, they're breathing out threatening and slaughtering against the disciples of Jehovah, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shrined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord says, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled and stood. And astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. And Saul rose from the earth. When his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was, he was three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananus. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananus. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire into the house of Judas for one called Saul, a Taurus. For behold, he prayeth. And had seen in a vision a man named Ananus coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. And Ananus answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear thy name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananus went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hand on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in thy way, as thou camest, has sent me, that thou might receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it has been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called in the name in Jerusalem? and came hither for that intent that he might bring him bound unto the priest, unto the chief priest. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelled in Damascus, proving this is very Christ, that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying the weight was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. When Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Then Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he went he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against Grecians, but they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Taurus. Then had the churches rested throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaritan and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit were multiplied. And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all the quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelled at Lydia. And there he found a certain man named Aninus, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. 
And Peter said unto him, Anetus, Jesus Christ makes it thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelled at Lydia and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Now there was at Jopia a certain disciple named Tabeath, which by interpretation is called Dorska. This woman was full of good works in all deeds which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. And when they had washed, washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. For as much as Lydia was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent out to him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought unto him the upper chamber. All the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats of the garments which Dorska made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth, kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known through all the Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass, he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a Tanner. That's the end of today's reading, the Holy Scripture. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate that. Um, that uh, impromptu reading of scripture. I know uh, you weren't on the schedule for that, but uh, did a great job. Thank you very much. Um, okay, if you all rise and take up your hymnals one more time, turn to page 75. On page 75, we'll sing a hymn. It comes from Psalm 99, titled Holy Mighty Majesty. That's Holy Mighty Majesty on page 75, after which we'll bring uh, Wes back, uh, or not back to the mic, but we'll bring Wes to the mic uh, to bring us the weekly news update. So uh, page 75, Holy Mighty Majesty. Okay, with that, we'll have our fourth hymn. If you'll rise and turn to page 82. On page 82, we'll sing a hymn that comes from Psalm 105, titled, O Give Thanks and Praise Yehovah. 
After which, we'll come back with the main message, which is a presentation by Mr. James Daly, Christ is Not Your Creator. Um, I thought since we, uh, we have some new people joining us, that it would be good to go through this, since it is one of our core uh, beliefs and doctrines, and, and critical to a proper understanding of the nature of God. So, oh, give thanks and praise Jehovah, after which we'll have Christ is Not Your Creator by James Daly. Okay, if you'll all be seated, we'll now have the main message from Mr. Daly. Christ is not your creator. Okay, good uh, Sabbath afternoon to everybody. Feast of Tabernacles for the Roman year 2010. And it's an interesting time to spend time with the uh, meat eater so we can study. And for the most part, we all understand the plan of God and know what uh, we're all talking about. Uh, we, over these last uh, decades, we're spending a bit more and more time on word studies because we've all uh, understood over the uh, decades that there are some problems with um, or translations in other languages from Hebrew and from Greek. And uh, some of the translations have been controlled by, uh, by Trinitarian writers that have to a degree succumbed to uh, rabbinical endorsements of word uses and name uses and this type of thing. But one of the more uh, interesting features of this is that uh, we've sort of been led to believe by, uh, by the supposed New Testament representations of the ancient Greek and the Koine and even ancient Hebrew that uh, names are applied to the incorrect beings. And Jesus Christ 
is uh, declared to be the creator of the whole universe and, and all that is in them. So every time there is a new microscope or magnifying glass and, and we discover that there's more to life than we ever suspected, uh, it's all been uh, given over to Jesus Christ being the creator of all. And uh, is that correct? And, and is that a, an idolatrous thought that we shouldn't be holding? Is it a salvation issue? You know, so that's part of our presentation here is, is um, to the world at large while we're still able to who you may worship and, and on what days you, your worship is acceptable and how we conduct ourselves in our worship. So this is a, an important feature, I think. It was presented uh, close to 15 years to uh, many of our previous assembly, and um, they were quite adamant. I had to be presenting about twice as many scriptures today as was presented then, and we'll see uh, after the service, Holy Day service here closes, we can ask to put it into an open forum and, and get people's responses so that if there's an error in the document, it can be changed. And if it needs to be expanded and, and there's other scriptures to use, that would be helpful. And then we'll hopefully we'll then proceed to publish this. So we'll see. So the topic today is Jesus Christ is not the creator of the universe and everything that is in them and would include all of the Adamic creation as well. So, Jesus Christ is Jehovah's chief executive officer, his uh, chief executive administrative officer, his right-hand man, and he's not your creator. In 1 Peter 1, 2, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but, but you, in, in uh, these things which have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels long to look into. So that's quite a, that's a 1 Peter 1, 2, which is quite a remarkable statement. Christ is not the creator of all things, that is all of the physical universe, Jehovah, the El Elyon, the God, the Almighty, our Father, and His Father is. Four Renewed Testament scriptures are used to falsely assert that Christ is the creator. John 1, Ephesians 3, verse 9, Colossians 1, verse 15, and Hebrews 1 as well. So we'll start with the Ephesians 3, verses 1 to 10. This is read from the New American Standard Bible. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there is made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to the holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Jesus Christ through the good news, to the gift of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the God Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, hidden in Theos, who had th created all things, in order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. So that's quite a remarkable you know, portion of the, of the letter to the Ephesians here, you know, the revelation that you can read in, in uh, three different chapters in the uh, in Hebrews, that these uh, Gentiles are not lost as individuals, but there is a plan to bring them or return them to life. But he's talking also here then about a mystery, that there are mysteries that God the Father has 
which he has not revealed to people or even those closest to him, those who are around his throne in the spirit world. So you can imagine he presents information as is suitable for the time and doesn't tell us anything we don't need to know. And we should then live the way of life he wants us to live in faith. So we very simply do what he wants us to do, do the very best we can, and not worry about the, you know, secret information and hidden knowledge and this type of thing, this gnosis that's demanded by people, and just wait until it's open. So if this heavenly host is before his throne in heaven, aren't given information, we shouldn't expect it, uh, uh, you know, expect it to be given to us personally. Now the Byzantine or majority text type is used by most translations as I just read above. By Jesus Christ was added to verse 9 in the Receptus and now is found in the King James, the New King James, Young's Literal, and Webster's translations of the Bible into English to make everyone falsely believe that Jesus Christ is creator of all. According to the text now held from the volume called Received, from the Latin title Textus Receptus, meaning the received text was born. So here's an example of it. The same 10 uh, verses in the King James Version. For this cause I, Paul, and, and pay attention to as this is read and, and see if you can notice the very different terminology that's used here comparing these two verses in their translations. Um, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me, to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, and now it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ in the gospel. Wherefore, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than least of all the saints. He thinks that because he actually, a few years earlier, had been murdering saints in possession of the Spirit of God. So that's why he's... Uh, He's thinking that way about himself. Um, the grace is given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable Richards of Christ and make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, so this is this is the rule and the authority and the individuals containing this rules and authority in the spirit world before the throne of God. This is referenced to and it'll come up again here shortly. So that seems would seem quite remarkable. You now have the beginning of the world in English, which the Greek word aeon doesn't mean. It means age. It's correctly translated in, um, in the uh, New American Standard into the mystery of ages which had been hidden in God, not from the foundation of the world. And that word then is loaded uh, to finish up this verse, has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So by Jesus Christ isn't in scripture. It's been added to make everyone believe Jesus Christ is the creator of all the physical creation. So, if it was clear from the Old Testament Tanakh that the future Messiah was the Creator and not God the Father, there would have been no need to add by Jesus Christ in Ephesians 3.9. It is clear from the whole Old Testament, everywhere, that God the Father is the Creator of all, the spirit world in this dimension, and the physical realm in this dimension. And there's no confusion about it anywhere. We must all study the Hebrew and Greek words used in the English and um, translations to be sure we are not misled by these idolaters. They are not; they will, are without fear in their gross intentional misrepresentation, and they have been very successful. 
Deuteronomy 4, 2, you shall not add to the word I'm commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of Jehovah, your God, which I command you. So this tampering with the Hebrew and the Greek is uh, deemed very serious. And is, uh, I don't know how the people that are doing these translations have any less of a responsibility if you're going to add scripture to make people think something very different about a doctrine. Is that as bad as people that are adding to and taking away from the commandments? I would say so, because we're judged by the spiritual application of the law. And people can't you know, sort of plead ignorance because they have to know what they were doing to make that type of translation. Continue. We will understand the scriptures by, the pre, by understanding the, he, the plan of God and the previously misheld, uh, withheld mysteries. We are all granted understanding that has not been granted to the spirit beings who assemble before his throne, and they long to look into us physical beings, or into what is given to us physical beings, which would seem quite remarkable. What a privilege we have to serve our Jehovah, because, I mean, we are given more than the beings surrounding his throne. Can you imagine? And yet that is typical of the mind of God, that he withholds people that are he has placed in a position of power and authority and gives it to people that they might hold in disdain and yet he will give him what they want to know and understand I find this just typical of the mind of our creator and God and father the almighty and yet what a privilege we have and we should appreciate it okay, well, let me just read it again 1 Peter 1 12 it was revealed to them the beings around his throne, that they were not serving themselves but you. So their, their work wasn't to take care of themselves and take care of everything they wanted, but us human beings, part of the Adamic creation. That's who they're to be serving and working for. In those things which are now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things which these angels, these beings in the spirit world, and actually around the throne of God long to look into, will be given to individuals like Paul and, and us. You know, we're coming to the end of the age here. We know more than most of the, the beings ever existed because of the privilege we have with, the, with a free society, reasonably free, and the historical information we have, and how lucky we are we can buy the whole Old and New Testament for about $15 in any bookstore. Formerly, it would have taken about five years of your work to get um, perhaps half of it in scrolls written. So what a lucky, how fortunate we are. So uh, this aspect of the spirit beings have to serve us, maggots, uh, may well be part of the cause of the initial rebellion. Lucifer and one-third of the host did not want to serve this weak physical creation. And you can see that in, uh, in the Isaiah 14, I think, and Ezekiel 28, perhaps, that he was beautiful and powerful and smart, and yet he was going to have to work for us. You know, and he, and he started out perfect in his, in his creation and then became a murderer and a liar from the beginning, which I would only conclude is the beginning of the Adamic creation. So he, he, he uh, lied to them and uh, caused their death and murdered them. So we'll see. This uh, mystery is that the Gentiles have the same inheritance that Christ has received after the successful completion of his task and his resurrection. That is, he, did, he now has life inherent, uh, which he did not have or he could not have died. And this actually is a salvation belief. Romans 10, 9, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe that with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now, the job description of what we will receive after our resurrection is not provided. This uh, revelation, formerly a mystery, is that all of the Adamic creation will receive the same salvation and inheritance as Messiah and all of Israel does. And the Gentiles are not excluded. So if you see in Ephesians 3, 7, of that which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power, to me, the very least of all saints, this faith was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. 
this is important for, for a bit later here. So what did God the Father create? Ephesians 3, 9, to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. So the, the mystery that God is going to create, save all of his created, the Adamic beings of creation, those that were not mixed with the DNA pre-flood, which is the, the reason for the flood, that all these uh, DNA mixed uh, beings uh, uh, drowned and died. And only individuals, you know, Noah being perfect, was perfect in his generations, meaning his DNA back to Adam, not perfect in his character. So um, God, the, the Father, Theo, created all things. The Almighty created all things in both the spirit, see in verse 10, and the physical dimensions, Verse 10, in order that the manifold wisdom of God might be known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So the understanding that was given to human beings long to be looked into by this host will be given to them by individuals like Paul in his writings. The saints of the Most High will be used to make known the wisdom of Jehovah, to make the spirit beings who come to know him personally and regularly come before him. Uh, there, there is a lot that they are, are not allowed to know, and they can learn it from us, which seems astonishing. It seems improbable to our way of thinking because we uh, must think like the Almighty in executing his plan for his creation. But you've been told repeatedly, dozens and dozens of scripture, your responsibility is come to know God, the Father, and his will, and his will in your life. You can know him and you can know his will. Don't be told you can't. All of us should consider seriously these scriptures that have been tampered with and understand that what change in thinking they are attempting to induce by their changes. You know, topic of twilight language and hidden words that brainwashes, this type of thing. Keep that in mind. What is it that they are trying to get you to think by their alteration of scripture? This exposes uh, the important considerations and what we should take special notice of these changes in the translation. So the fact that they've been able to do this and confound half the planet Earth is not reassuring, but really it should be to us because it makes it very clear and very easy to know what uh, your thinking and in in understanding the plan of God and the will for you is targeting and they don't want you to believe. So they don't want you to believe that God created all things. They want you to believe that God created all things by or through Jesus Christ. Everyone should have a Greek Septuagint in their Bible collection as it received uh, no real opposition until after Messiah's death. It's a fairly, fairly well translated. I think we all know the, the history of, of that uh, preparation 200 BC of that uh, Greek manuscript now Islam correctly states that the Old Testament was corrupted by the Pharisees in the first four centuries and it was there was evidence that years were altered in scripture to confuse people over the timing of the virgin birth and the appearance of Messiah which is what they were using as grounds from the second century with Jamia and they couldn't make those alterations to the Septuagint which was Greek and throughout the Greek world, where they had a fairly uh, uh, <coughs> a fairly good control on the Hebrew text, it was uh, so. They removed the name Jehovah by altering the vowels and declared that Adonai or Lord was to be used, and which is found in all modern translations. Now this is so serious that they may lose their share in the world to come, as they put it. You know, you, you, Jehovah disagrees with this policy of um, having his name removed from Scripture. Second Kings twenty three twenty seven, Jehovah said, "I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I removed Israel. I will reject the city which I have chosen, and the house of which I said my name shall be there." <laughs> That's a rendering from Darby. The Septuagint states that the boundaries of the nations are set by the spirit beings. 
Deuteronomy 31, 8, when the Most High divided the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the nations according to the number of the angels of God. So these are angels that were assigned responsibility to these different tribal groups. There's no such thing as races. There's only one race, the human race. Then there are family and tribal groups. And these angels or these spirit beings have responsibility for them. They were to ensure that they are keeping the terms of the covenant. They maintain their boundaries and the levels in there so that they can be the administrative responsibilities for that. Now, the Pharisees altered scripture from Jamnia to make them the ones who set the boundaries. Uh, here's the same verse written by the, uh, altered by the Pharisees. Deuteronomy 31, 8. When the Most High divided the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Well, that is a monster difference, don't you think? From the sons of God or the angels of God, change it to the son, children of Israel. They believed that the, the ten tribes had been eradicated, and that they, of course, then were the only inheritors of the promises to Israel, the, the Jews of the day in Judah. So they have no, no calm about uh, altering scripture. Here. So what did Jesus Christ create? Did he create anything? The Christ created or established or made or instituted the ad administrative system in the spirit and physical worlds. Colossians 1, 15 to 18, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities. You see that. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and the earth, as the spirit and physical worlds. You can see from visible and invisible. Here's what he created. Thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. He is before all things. That's a loaded sentence. And in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. So in King James, how does it render? He who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven or on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, uh, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. By him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. So they're uh, fairly closely re rendered, but uh, I'm sure you're, you're picking up the, the key points in this. So, um, Yahashua is the icon, a representative of the one true God. He is invisible to us or not present because he cannot reside with us in our state of sin. We would all die. So he's the firstborn of all creation. He is the first of the physically or human-born beings of the spirit world, for by him all things were created. The word is kit, uh, titso, meaning to build or to create, or rendered either way, to build or manufacture. He created or made or built all of the administrative structure in the spirit as well as the physical realms, both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, not in the spirit world, which is invisible, and not seen by us except by Jehovah's grace. So it's invisible to the Adamic creation. So whether thrones, so this is a... a, a chair of state having a footstool, hence a kingly power or authority, metaphorically to God, the governor of the world, to the Messiah, the Christ, his partner and assistant in the divine administration. And uh, so you're talking about a divine and a physical administrative position of authority, as, this, as the Greek term thrones is used here. So this is representing the seat of power, which judgments over the government are made like the seat of Moses. 
dominions, meaning a dominion, power, lordship, the one who possesses dominion. And this uh, includes then the territory or the dimensions that an individual or authority exerts control or power over. So it's the individual and the territorial authority that are assigned with it, rulers, uh, beginning, origin, the person or thing that commences, the first person or thing in a series, a leader, um, an active cause or the extremity. And you see now here you have some other rendering that's uh, less on the list here. Of the corners of a sail or the edge or the boundary. And part of these things is because there is a boundary to the creation, which evolution say there is no, that, that all of the physical universe has no boundary and it has no center. And scripture says it has a boundary, a line, outline, in which it's contained and the center. So, um, continuing on, and powers and authority. So the power, or the power to act, uh, act and the authority. So all, the, all these things, rendered in English, are been created by him and for him. So all these seats, territory, time, because time wasn't, a, wasn't a, in this list of the four words here correctly. But, it, but uh, we'll see shortly how it was uh, translated. Uh, we're established by Messiah. The time of his rule over planet Earth is approaching and will be determined by his God and Father, Jehovah. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So we would generally take that to mean that, well, he, he was before all things, meaning before the universe and the spirit world was created. And that's how it's presented. He was before, in time. Well, the word doesn't mean before in time. He is at the head of, or above, or in first place, not before all things in time, as we can see below, verse 18. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place or preeminence in everything. It's not before in time. He will have first place as its head at his second coming. Colossians 1.15, you know, we've covered this a few times. Here's, a, here's another rendering of it. Who is the image or perfect reflection of the invisible God, the first human born of every spirit being. For by him all the administrative structures were instituted that are in the spirit world and that are in the earthly world, which are both visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were instituted by him and for him. He is the head of all these things, and by him all these things consist. He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that, all, that in all administrative affairs he might have the preeminence. Isaiah chapters 40 to 46 has a detailed discussion on Eloah, who is Jehovah, and his creative activities, which he accomplished alone, not through an agent, not through an emissary, not by any other means, all alone. And that's why it's interesting that these, it's only four verses, not very long verses, that have been mistranslated that are used by the Trinitarians to prove, from their point of view, that Jesus Christ is the creator of all things in the physical and spiritual world. Now, many of covenant-keeping Christian churches actually hold this belief as well, although they, they generally have dropped the belief that, that he created the spirit world, but retain the belief that he, he, uh, that he uh, created all of the uh, physical universe and everything therein. So, Psalm 1831, just for clarification, for who is Eloah but Yehovah? Who is a rock except our Elohim? So when you see the term Yehovah or Eloah, they're both used in scriptures on occasion uh, that you're, you can be understand from the frame of reference that it's using the name in one place and a title in the other. Okay, Hebrew allows the terms El, Elohim, El Elyon, to refer to Eloah, and also the names derived from Yod Heh Vav Heh, 
This is termed in Greek the tetragrammaton, four letters, and it does not mean Lord. In most cases, Eloah is evident from the context or the title is used amongst others as in Isaiah 44, 8. So remember, as in Ecclesiastes 12, 1, it is him we serve and not his creation, Romans 1, 25, which we are responsible to protect and maintain. Christ is the first one of God's spiritual creation, Revelation 3, 14, who was born human being and died. The Father cannot die, Romans 10, 9, 1 Timothy 6, 16. So when being, people are going to claim that Jesus Christ is, is a binitarian or potentially a, a deistic structure of two true gods, how can one of them die and one never can? Straight pagan theology that's being brought into our faiths with all of this historical background is. Christ is the first one of God's spiritual creation, so first in the spirit world to become a human being. Many, many others will, including Satan, who will be made human and die. So, the Father does not have a life he can lose in any event. He is life. He created life. He gave us all life. It's not something, oh, I think I'll die this week to save my creation. And that's how it's rendered. Oh, you know. He is life. He doesn't have life. Death is part of this creative plan. And, and the second, first and second laws of thermodynamics prove it. Everything is deteriorating, and it's all going to deteriorate. And then there'll be a new heavens and a new earth, and it'll continue on in the manner that the Almighty uh, wished it to go in the first place. But we found it too difficult to follow the few simple things he told us to do, like you, you have this whole garden. And it's in a beautiful temperature. It's never hot or never cold. You can eat all the fruit you want, just don't eat the fruit from that tree. But we weren't able to do that, so here we are. Um, this physical human thinking that is applied to a being that is outside of its creation is almost nonstop, and, and you'd think they'd be embarrassed about it. It is a salvation belief that Christ died and would have remained dead and rotten without his Redeemer's intercession. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a salvation belief that Jesus Christ died, and if he hadn't been resurrected, he'd still be dead. Keep that in mind. God the Father can't die. He is life. Now Christ created or built or made or developed the boards of government the administrative districts as we see in Colossians 1.16. He instituted the kingdoms or the heads of state. He set up their dominions and their time and power to act. And Satan has his time and power to act. And when he's, re after the Messiah's return on the day of trumpets, 10 days or 10 years later, he'll be put in, um, into a jail or into captivity where he can't hurt anyone else. <coughs> But his life isn't taken away from him then because he has a time to act and he'll be released again at the end of the millennium. Which, of course, to our human way of thinking, we would never do. If somebody's too much trouble, they should just be killed. No. The time and the territory and the jurisdiction has been granted and it will be given full, fully completed. It seems difficult to, to grasp that from our human ways of thinking. But anyway... Uh, this in no way means that Jesus Christ created the whole physical universe. It's talking about the administrative structure and heads of state and territories and time and their power. So that's what that means. He now, after the successful completion of his task and resurrection, has been given life in Herod. He did not have it or he would not have needed to receive it as a gift from his God and Father. John 5, 26. Couldn't be clearer. He is before not before in time, meaning he was with his uh, superior brother God in time before anything was created. And then they somehow jointly did it together. That's not what this is rendering in English. We are reading that into it, and that's uh, incorrect. He is at the head of all of these administrations. That's how he is before, not in time. He's at the head of. 
Colossians 1.17. Often the development or configuring of these administrative structures gets confused with the complete spiritual and material creations that exist in their own dimensions. So we'll cover that again. Colossians 1.15-17 is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for him, by him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. It doesn't say whether all of the creation and every star and everything else and all of the laws and the gravity and every other force is required to have this, this universal system function. It doesn't say that at all. All things have been created for him, uh, by him, and for him. He is um, before all things, and in him all things hold together. The visible and invisible are the physical and spirit realms. These have their thrones or dominions, which are the seats of administrative power, as kings or rulers, as executive officers and territories that these authorities oversee, which Christ put in place, verse 16, and is the head over. He is before them. Verse 17. In no place is Christ stated to be the creator of the spirit or physical universes. He is God's right-hand man, Colossians 3, 1, his CEO. We could conclude that Christ, with, when he was within the garden with the other Elohim, or gods, may have participated in the manufacture of the Adamic beings. The heir of this reason makes Christ your creator and a being we can worship. In fact, we ought to worship if he's your creator. And so what are we told? The word worship needs a follow-up to, to follow along with this document. But in any way, we are told to worship God the Father only or alone. Matthew 4.10, Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan. It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. See that reflected in the Exodus 34.14. You shall not worship any other God for Jehovah, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So there's only one true God that you're allowed to worship. We're using the title term Eloah for the name Jehovah, Allah, and there are other names that are uh, reasonable as well in Arabic and with other pronunciations. So we have to perhaps do a bit more of a thorough study of the, of the names, issues, and, and that type of thing. But I think you can see you're still talking about worshiping the God the Father only. So the idea that a subordinate son, a being, a son, or a second in a trinity, which is, is actually the creator of the heaven and earth and everything that is found in many, it is found in many ancient religious systems, as well as certain modern covenant-keeping bodies to our shame. So more work will have to be done on to compile a greater list of the human-born sons or gods or hypostases that are declared to be their creator. They are numerous. Here's a few. Christ's and mediators, false Christ's and mediators. Many pagan religions preempted features of covenant-keeping Christianity. So they're preempting what happened with Jesus Christ in A.D. 30. There are numerous crucified virgin-born saviors and mediators, baptisms, forgivenesses of sin, a Lord's Supper with unleavened bread but without wine, they used holy water, resurrections, and a Christ figure as the creator, et cetera, ad nauseum. Many of these have mystical features and would also have features that we would recognize as evolutionary in substance. According to the religion of the ancient Assyrians, Marduk, the Logos, the Word, the eldest son of Ha, the merciful one, the life giver, who created the heavens, the earth, and all that is therein. Sound familiar? Bonwick, Egyptian belief, page 404. Adonis, the Lord and Savior, was belie believed to be the creator of mankind and God of the resurrection of the dead. Dunlop, Mysteries of Adonai, page 156. Prometheus, a crucified savior, is a divine forethought. So here we go now. Existing before the souls of men and the creator. Hominium, uh, page 156. Samuel Johnson, from uh, D.O. Allen's, Allen's India, pages 137 and 380. 
And Thomas Morris, Indian Antiquities, volume 2, page 288, tells us that according to the religion of the Hindus, it is Krishna, the second, the second person in the ever-blessed trinity who is the origin and end of all the worlds. All this universe came into being through him, the eternal makers. Uh, you see that in, in um, Oriental religions, page of 502. Chinese believed in one supreme God whose honor they burnt incense, but of whom they had no image. This uh, God the Father was not the creator, according to their theology or mythology. They had another God of whom they had statues and idols called Nagatai, who was the God of all terrestrial things. In fact, he is God, creator of this world, which was inferior or subordinate to the supreme being in whom they petitioned for fine weather, or whatever else they want, as he was this mediator. So the second being in the divine trinity is a mediator. According to the ancient Persian mythology, there is one supreme essence that is invisible and incomprehensible. So our God and Father, who is almighty, says he is not incomprehensible. We can and should know. And we better get started on knowing his will and and in the understanding his mind. Now this, uh, this incomprehensible being, which you get in, in modern Catholicism because it, it is, the Trinity is incomprehensible. And they say, you know, it's made up of three distinct but not separate beings and you can't understand that because it's a mystery. And, and uh, well, that's right, it is understandable. Or here, incomprehensible. But it signifies unlimited time or the eternal from him emanated Ormzus, uh, the king of light, the firstborn of the eternal one. Now, this firstborn of the eternal one is he who came, who, uh, from whom all things were made, all things came into being through him. He is the creator. So the firstborn of the one eternal one, the second being, and his son is actually the creator in pagan theology. The first century, Mithras was worshipped as a virgin-born savior, born on December 25th, which was the ancient day of the winter solstice. Let's move now to, to uh, our Roman December 25th, is the modern solstice, but the ancient day of the solstice, when these virgin-born saviors were born on. Uh, Mithras was one of them. The worshippers met in caves, and this was around Rome, and came and came to be there at the time of that uh, Paul and others were there. So the, the Mithraic mysteries overlap the beginning of what we're terming Christianity. They washed feet, kept the type of supper with unleavened bread and holy water. They didn't drink and didn't use wine. Uh, there has been a copying of the features of the salvation beliefs with components missing for thousands of years. So a lot of these 16 crucified saviors held most or some, but not all, of the actual Lord's Supper, the actual true baptisms, and all this type of thing. But they did know what was coming, or at least a features of it, and then corrupted it. You can find 16 crucified saviors, and there's two books written on it. I don't recall the individual's name who wrote it. In the third century common era, the worshipers of the mystery, Mithraic mysteries complained to the Roman authorities that these modern Christians, meaning the Church of God at Rome that was becoming Binitarian at the time and later became Trinitarian, were stealing all their doctrines. This means false idolaters Christians from Rome and not the covenant-keeping Unitarian followers in the way in Rome and who eventually had to flee for their lives and uh, genuine true keepers of the, of, the, of the covenant and the way of God. So I think you can see, should be clear enough that we can see from the above references, there have been many sons of a trinity who are declared to be creator of all. Jesus Christ is our brother and co-inheritor, co-heir. Romans 8, 17, Galatians 3, 29, James 2, 5, of eternal life in the kingdom of God. Ephesians 3, 6, Titus 3, 7, James 2, 5. He is not the creator, but our fellow heir. Romans 8, 17. And if children, heirs also, 
heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We receive our inheritance from our God and Father and will receive the same inheritance as Jesus Christ has now received in the first resurrection as the first of the first fruits. Jesus Christ was. The first fruits have been following for the past 2,000 years or heading for 40 jubilees now shortly. Um, it'll be interesting to see you know, if we all make it to the first resurrection how this all comes about. So Hebrews 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us through his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. He is the radiance of his glory. Keep in mind the word world there. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, his icon, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. They're using the name Yahashua, but he has a new name. Because when your relationship with God your Father is modified, your name changes. Same with Abraham and Abraham and all, all everyone. And here you have the same thing with the Messiah. So he has a new name. But we will be using Yahashua or Jesus or Jesus you know, for ensuring we're identifying him correctly, even though it wouldn't be understood in, in uh, ancient Hebrew 3,000 years ago. So, for which said to, of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Again, I will be a father to him, he will be a son to me. And when he says again, and brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. Right, with the angels, he says, Who ministers, makes his angels winds, his ministers a flame of fire? Of the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You love righteousness, hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. You, O Lord, in the beginning did lay the foundation of the planet Earth, and the heavens are the works of your hand. So I just uh, break some of the verses of this uh, chapter down just for, for an open commentary on it. So Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1. Uh, He appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the ages. Aeon, not world, as it was rendered in English to make you think he's talking about planet Earth. It doesn't say planet Earth. It says the age, which is what he set up when he originally set up the administrative structure. Certain time periods for the rulers and their boundaries to act. So through whom he made the age. Messiah made or created or set in place the administrative structure and the world order or cosmos in the 6,000 year time and age for it to act is for its own will and not for planet earth. Now Hebrews 1, 3, he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature upholds all things by the word of his power. It's quite a statement here. Uh, when he had made purification for sins who sat down at the right hand of majesty on high he upholds the administrative structure by his powerful speech by the word of his power as it's jumbled in English here. He is now God's right hand man which we all understand so then after the Lord had uh, spoken unto them he received unto heaven and sat on the right hand of God uh, from Mark uh, 14 19 he has a new name from the successful completion of your of your task. Uh, we saw that in Hebrews 1, 4. He now has life inherent, which is the main point of the inheritance. We all have the same inheritance as Jesus Christ did, which has nothing to do with the job description you're going to have at your resurrection. You have the same inheritance, you just don't have the same job description. John 5, 26, For as the Father has life in himself, 
He, ha he is life. He is life inherent. He gave to the Son to have life in himself. So after his resurrection and the successful completion of his task, then he was given life, which is why he can be said to be in, have eternal life in the kingdom of God. But he didn't have it before. He didn't have it as a spirit being because he could have been made a human being and died and not been brought back to life. He'd be dead. And the identical thing is going to happen with Satan. He'll be made a human being and die and turn to dust on the earth. So it's represented as, as not being possible, like, like angels can't die and they can live forever and anything else. Well, that's a, that's a pagan theological misrepresentation held by many Christian churches. Okay. Hebrews 1 5, to which my angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten thee. I will be a father up to him. He shall be a son to me when he brings again his firstborn into the world. So this is talking about bringing him, Christ returning to the physical planet Earth. World there is 3625. And uh, that word has, has an interesting feature to it that people could spend a bit of time on, on reviewing. So it's the whole inhabited earth, the inhabitants of the earth, etc. So Jehovah will once again return and take his human, first human-born son into the inhabited earth. And yet here we go with all the angels will worship. So we have a loaded English word, which really means humbly beseech. Well, the angels can humbly beseech him. Proskuneo. You can see it's uh, falling on the knees, touching the ground with the forehead, um, you know, making obeisance in order to express respect or to make supplication, used of homage to men or any being of a, a superior rank. So that's army. And you see it amongst the, um, amongst the, I guess specifically the Japanese, that they bow to older, older in their family. They bow to older in rank, they're superior in rank, this type of thing. So we generally don't, don't conduct ourselves quite that way, but we stand at attention and salute, often stand up when the elder did come into the room if you're sitting at a table, that type of thing. So that's what this term proskuneo is, is rendering, not worship as we generally think of and, and apply to our God and Father. Okay, um, the angels will beseech the Elohim, Messiah, who has been anointed uh, above them all. Um, so therefore God, thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above their companions. So he was from the spirit world, part of the first creation of his God and Father, who was his God and Father as well, and it was anointed or given this responsibility above these spirit beings, above his companions. And uh, so you're talking about your throne or your seat of authority, right? So you, Jehovah, laid the foundations of the earth and universe. In verse 10, you, Lord, in the beginning did lay the foundation of the earth and the heavens and are the work of your hands, not Jesus Christ's hands. He, as he told Job, while the spirit being were happy with the second creation which he created, Job 38, 2, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, I'll ask you, and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the planet Earth? Tell me if you have any understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Or stretched its line upon it? Or one what's where base is sunk? Who lays its cornerstone? When the morning stars, the Lucifers, probably four of them, but we're, we're not given the exact number, just we know there's more than one. Uh, uh, sang together, and the sons of God, the spirit beings in the spirit world, we could often term Elohim, or, or small g gods in English, as much as beings of the spirit world, shouted for joy. So that's quite a statement there. Isaiah 40, 21, don't you know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood the foundations of the earth? See, that's why you have to be a bit cautious in, in, in seeing the word world 
because it can come from, from the word cosmos, which is world order, or orats from the planet Earth. So that's why we have to review the Greek and the Hebrew words on which our English renderings are taken from, just as a caution. I think we all know that. Isaiah 40, 28, don't you know, have you not heard the everlasting God, Jehovah, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. So it doesn't show Jesus Christ as, uh, or any other being, as uh, the creator or manufacturer of the, of the ends of the planet Earth. And Jesus Christ is not his equal. Isaiah 40, 25, To whom then will you liken me, that I should be his equal, says the Holy One. Isaiah 41, 4, Who has performed and accomplished this? calling forth the generations from the beginning. I, Jehovah, am the first, the last, I am he. 41.20, And they may see and recognize and consider and gain insight as well that the hand of Jehovah has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has created it. Isaiah 42.5, Thus says Jehovah, who created the heavens, stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it, and the spirit who walk in it. So, as we saw in Psalm 18, Jehovah is Eloah. And it can be contested until the cows come home, which they often don't. And, and uh, you can debate that, and you can claim that Jesus Christ created everything. But it, there's no Old Testament scriptural evidence. All there is is for New Testament corrupted translations. Uh, and uh, that we've so many people have swallowed whole it seems astonishing anyway the stretching of the heavens is interesting because when when you see this uh, daylight and time and the, the light from stars that can now be shown or purported to be shown to be uh, billions of years old well it, at the beginning of the foundation of the planets when he was putting them together he stretched them so these the universe was stretched out, and that's where this apparent difference in time to purport to have a four billion years comes from. But it's not scriptural. He stretched it out. The main point here is God Almighty is alone. Isaiah 44, 6, Thus says Jehovah, the King of Israel, his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, the last. Is there, there is no God besides me who is like me, let him proclaim and declare it, yes. Let him recount it to me in order from the time that I established an ancient nation. Let them declare to them the tidings that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Have I not since announced to you and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any Elohim besides me? Is there any other rock I know of none? Isaiah 43.10, you are my witnesses, declares Jehovah, my servant I have chosen in order that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God, no Elohim. There will be none after me. I, even I, am Jehovah. There is no Savior besides me. So God the Almighty, Eloah, is the Savior of all. The Isaiah 45, 5, I am Jehovah, there is no other. Besides me, there is no L, I believe it is in that, uh, in that verse. I will gird you, though you have not known me. Isaiah 46, 9, remember the former things long past. I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is no one like me. He did not use Christ as his agent in creating. He managed to create all by himself. Isaiah 44, 24, thus says Jehovah, your Redeemer, the one who formed you in the room, I, Jehovah, am the maker of all these things, stretching out the heavens all by myself, spreading out the earth all alone. So people can contest that if they would like. Isaiah 45, 12, it is I who made Eretz, the earth. I created mankind, the Adama, on them. I stretched out the heavens with my hands, I ordained all the host. 45.18, thus says Jehovah, who created the heavens, that is the whole universe. It is he who formed the um, Eretz, or the planet Earth, and made it. 
He established it and he did not create it as a waste place but formed it to be inhabited. I am Jehovah and there is no one else. So Jehovah says, John 1.1 1, 1 is the main one that's used by most people. So we'll cover this uh, not in too much detail because that takes uh, sort of 10 to 20 pages to go over the grammar, but here's the main highlight of this. Uh, the translations, at least in English that I'm familiar with, but as I understand it, uh, French and Spanish and German and others have just have all been captured by the Trinitarian translations. Uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And archaean ho logos kai, ho logos and pros ton theon. In a beginning. Lots of beginnings. It's rendered to make you think it's in the beginning of the, of what? Presumably the physical world, but not necessarily. In a beginning, logos was. The word logos is a study on its own as well, another 10 to 20 pages. And the word was spiritually aligned with. Right? And the word was with God. He was, he leaned towards or was for, pro, proston theon, pro this God. So when you're pro something, you are for it in your thinking. You're, you're for that hockey team and against that hockey team. We, you know, that is what that word means. The word was for the one true God, Theos. Ho Theos. So, you know, in, in a beginning, the word was uh, spiritually aligned with or leaned towards or was for and was not with the God before time began. It doesn't say it was before. We read that into it in English from our brainwashing and our, you know, eating, swallowing this twilight language whole. They're not spitting it out. So our responsibility is to ensure that we have our theology correct. We make corrections where we find it. And we point out to other people if they ask us any of their important errors in their worship and their understanding. So this one is fairly important. Uh, you have to continue on with John 1, with um, uh, 2, 3, and 4. Well, we're really up to, up to verse 10 to make sure because you see, well, I'll read it here. Um, nothing came into being, uh, verse 3, all the things that came into being by him and apart from him, nothing came into being that, was, that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. As the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, then there came a man whose name was sent by God the Father, John the Baptist. He came for a witness that he might bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness of the light. And there was the true light which coming into the world and lights every man. He was in the world order. He was in the cosmos, and the world was made through him and the world order did not know him. So you really need to look up all of 9 and 10 for where the English term world is used and where it is cosmos or, or where it is the Greek for the, uh, the physical planet Earth. I just wanted to leave it with that just to make it um, hopefully obvious to you what it is that can confuse your thinking. Because when you would read this over, you certainly could come to con potentially the confusion, especially if everybody around you and whole churches believe it and, and state it as fact. And, um, but it's not that complicated to point out that it's impossible. Okay, but I'll just, I'll leave with that. The difficulty with the words worship and the logos and these are, are uh, 20 page Bible studies. All I wanted to do today was make a point of this and that, uh, it, uh, that make it very simple to contest if somebody wants to, because it, it should be pretty simple if you contest this, if you can show that Jesus Christ is the creator of, of uh, the universe and all that is in it, then, uh, then uh, I'd be pleased to hear it. So um, I will close with that, and thank you very much for your ears.
and uh, we can close it and then open it up for a, for a review. And I will write down every scripture that uh, is recommended here and every change in the wording. Um, I've sort of rewritten this, uh, I don't know how many times now, since about 1995, and it was first given overseas as, a, as an informal study. And so it's, uh, I appreciate some, I've had some very good recommendations over time and certainly appreciated them. So we'll close with that and uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, James. Certainly appreciate that. You know, I've, I've listened to this presentation many times and, uh, and uh, you know, I seem to learn something new every time I go through it. So uh, thanks again. I appreciate it, as I'm sure we all do. If you will all rise one more time and open your hymnals to page 90. On page 90, we'll sing a hymn that comes from Psalm 119 titled, Oh, How uh, Love I Thy Law. After which, I'd like to call Mr. Eric Aristide to the microphone to close in prayer. So, page 90, Oh, How Love I Thy Law. Okay, if you'll remain standing for the closing prayer, we'll open the mic to Mr. Eric Aristide. Eric? Heavenly Father, here are before you your humble servants whose life would be nothing without you. We thank you, Father, for your many benefits for the life you give us, and for the grace to know your word and to live through it. Forgive us for our personal mistakes, sometimes unconsciously committed, and never allow the light that you put in us to go out. But give us your Holy Spirit to guide us and help us to keep your flame always burning in us. May it be always your will in all circumstances and never ours. Make us shine for your glory and let the whole world know that you are with us and that by our conduct we may draw towards you those whose uh, heart would be willing to hear the truth. We pray for all those who have not yet been touched by your word. Touch them, O oh God. Bless your people in every place, Father, and prepare us 
for your kingdom of glory. We pray you, Father, in the name and by the authority of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen.